Oh, you're like Mark Marin. Uh, you're talking to him, and then you realize you're on. Yes, uh, with the Kids in the Hall show, uh, we, we were uh, we were writing, and three weeks in, we started uh, the last week of February, <laughs> and three weeks in on a Thursday, the NBA canceled, and Tom Hanks got it, so we weren't allowed to because of the combination of NBA and Tom Hanks to go to the writers' room anymore. And they flew us to Toronto. Some of us live in Toronto. I don't. So I was stuck in the apartment building. The apartment building was also the same building the writers' room was in. And um, if you're kind of uh, introverted, um, like me, it was kind of neat. Um, and, but then it became crazy when you were forced to stay inside the building uh, a lot of the time. And so we would um, meet every hour on, a, it's not Zoom, it's called Blue Jeans, because they mm -hmm. figure because we're old, it's more user friendly, because we're old. And so, um, <laughs> and it really wasn't, or we're older than it's user friendly. And so we'd uh, meet every hour, organize, um, at the, uh, on a Friday we'd have a read through, but then, but most of it was in the afternoons by ourselves writing. There's gonna be a lot of sketches about isolation, like loneliness and isolation. There's a, uh, there's a lot of sketches about that. Is that right? You feel like when, when it does come out that it'll be very inadvertently COVID influenced? I, so many, well, uh, for example, uh, um, for the first two or three weeks, the, the hot, uh, the, uh, there was no hot water in my bathtub. And it was, um, I kept saying it was lukewarm. So now we have a sketch called lukewarm, but a guy who lives by himself. Um, and because um, I told this, the, the kids who wrote it, uh, our old uh, head writer, Gary Campbell was there. And, um, and we had new young kids to write. <laughs> the, uh, and um, <laughs> I'm laughing. It's just how old we are. But uh, I told this uh, at the writer's room in the morning, right before we, um, we were still going to the writer's room in the first three weeks. And Gary said, it'd be funny because I said, I keep calling the janitor, but he never fixes it. And then he said, it'd be funny if you found out that uh, the water's hot, but the janitor takes a bath for two or three hours every day and it gets colder. Um, and then, uh, then I thought of an exaggeration of that, which I won't say. And then um, uh, a sketch was born. So there's a lot of sketches like that. Um, I, I, I wrote another sketch. I shouldn't tell so many sketches. <laughs> I just wrote a lot of sketches about guys that live. Well, there's one sketch about a, um, because this is based on a true story where um, also Norm Hiscock, our old writer, um, he was stuck with me. He was in the apartment next to me. So him and I, for three weeks, because he was there for only three weeks, where I was there for 11, he, um, for three weeks, we just saw each other all the time. We saw movies at night, classic soccer games from 1992. Um, and so we wrote a lot together. And uh, my computer broke down, so I called a guy. I called Apple, and the guy's name was Charlie. And he kept calling me back to see if I um, um, needed help. And so, of course, we have a scene called Charlie about a guy with a computer breaks down who gets obsessed with, no, I want Charlie! He talked to me yesterday! And I'm not telling you the funniest parts of the scenes, I swear to God. So everybody was in Toronto for the, the yes. writing, but nobody was actually in the same room together. We were at first for three weeks. We were, um, Mark didn't come till after that, so um, we never saw Mark. We only saw Mark virtually. Though every now and then I'd go on a long walk with them um, six feet apart with, in masks. But we were, uh, we had three weeks of writing room. Very small writing. It was like a smaller version of the apartments that, uh, that I was staying in. And, um, so, and then we had virtual writing rooms. We had, uh, so we'd meet, we'd spritz ideas. We'd let the new kids spritz their ideas. Uh, and, then, and then we would ignore them and uh, all afternoon write our own ideas. Spritzing is a, that's a, a vaudeville term. Rich, yes, yes it is, exactly, it is. I learned that in my uh, first session in Second City when I was 19. Um, and I told Dave and he loved it. And so we, uh, now the kids and all say spritz all the time. But yeah, it's, I guess it's not, if you're in the comedy world, uh, you can figure it out right away what it means. You know, it's it's the talk and talk and nonsense and an idea will pop out. It's hanging out, right? It's hanging out with another pretty person yes. and kind of ripping That's exactly what them. it is. I let that part out. Actually, I use, when I describe it to people, I usually use the phrase uh, hanging out. Is hanging out a phrase or is it just yeah. the word you hang out? Dave and I hung out all the time, and that's how we uh, end up with Citizen Kane. Sometimes, like, it's real. Like, we were having a real argument about something that Dave was obviously wrong about. We were at a sandwich shop across from the apartment building we lived in in our early 20s in Toronto. And, um, and after a while, Dave began to realize he was wrong. But he's, and so he then is slowly involved in a spritzing where he sort of starts playing a character of a guy named Dave Foley and he um, gets more stubborn. And then we've, uh, we laughed and we stopped. And then Dave said the magic words, this could be a sketch. What if we were talking about something really obvious like Citizen Kane, which I guess nowadays if a troop wrote it, it would be, what if we wrote the, about a movie that's really obvious, like Back to the Future? Like, no one would know. It's been a while, but that's a sketch where you stab Dave in the chest repeatedly yeah. with a fork. Is I that right? In the hand. Oh, yeah. At the end, I stab him in the chest. It's funny. Uh, we didn't have an ending. And then Dave thought, uh, why don't you stab me in the hand? 
and th this other kids in the hall are, we're so hip. Uh, we were like Queen Street in Toronto in the 80s, which is like Greenwich Village in the 50s. We're so hip. And um, Mark and Bruce thought, thought that was so square, stabbing someone in the, in the hand. And the audience decided, oh my God, that's so dark. That's so cool. Who would think of that? But it is kind of square. <laughs> I get the sense, like having listened to interviews that you and the other guys have done, that a lot of stuff that was perceived as being dark didn't necessarily feel that dark when you were writing or performing it. Yes. Yeah. We never, um, we never thought in terms of that. It, it was always about whether it was funny enough or not. And later people would tell us it was dark and we're not stupid. We'd say, oh yeah, I guess it is. And if we thought something was dark right away, there's one thing that Dave and I thought of really dark that I'm not going to say because my uh, stepkids might hear me. Uh, and a lot of things Scott thought that this is really dark. And those things never really worked. If you're funny and naturally dark, that's going to happen. Uh, like Scott didn't know it was dark. I think the most brilliant, th one of the most brilliant things uh, the kids and all ever did, and in my opinion, the most brilliant thing Scott ever wrote was that scene where he plays the actor who's in that show Surf Cop and he's a closeted um, a gay man, but he, but he hides it. Even the most brilliant thing is he even hides it when he's dead at the open casket. People are saying, I heard he died of AIDS. And then from, the, from death, he goes, uh, cancer. <laughs> like, we, were, we just thought that was funny. And I remember the reporter saying, that's really dark. And I remember being a pause and us looking at each other go, oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. I think the only guys who can pull it off who know it's dark but are funny enough that it's funny are South Park. That joke specifically is something that, you know, I, I wonder if, I wonder if the context for why it was dark, I wonder if people would still kind of understand that. I mean, that like, that's a very dark joke coming out of, like yeah. here in the States, coming out of Reagan in the 80s. That, that makes that an incredibly dark joke. Yes. And nowadays it might be accidentally offensive. I don't know. If, if you don't get inside the joke, he's satirizing a guy like that, but it's not the guy's fault. It's the society of the guys. But we don't say all that. We just do the comedy. So it's very easy to misunderstand it now in 2020 and find it offensive. Uh, I, I would understand that. In my heart, I know that um, it isn't. But if someone ever said that it was, I would just agree with them and move on and say that I'm an old man. In a lot of ways, the kids in the hall were, were, were very progressive, you know, certainly when it comes to like LGBTQ issues, uh, Scott, obviously being a, a big part of that. Is there anything though that you look back on that maybe, maybe didn't handle it the right way, or perhaps, you know, uh, as society has changed, didn't age in the way that you had hoped it would? Probably a few things of Scott's that other people think that. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, well, there's, if I bring it up, I'm, I'm, I'm opening the sore, right? I think it's good to talk about these things. Well, we, um, we did, um, Mark had that brilliant character and, and Scott did it once to, uh, I guess, blackface. When he did the brilliant, char uh, brilliant character about a college kid who was a blues singer. But I got to tell you, we, he did it live and he didn't, he didn't like, he just did it like himself. And we're, we're sort of morons. We go for the comedy. We weren't being politically correct, but Dave and I said, um, no, don't put it on your face in TV. It ruins the joke. You're a white guy, uh, that, that ruins the joke. So now that we were being good, we just <laughs> we just thought it was better comedy, but he did it anyway, and now he regrets it. I saw you when I was living in California. I saw you at uh, maybe the Warfield in in San Francisco on the tour, and 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 that was I think that might have even been the opening sketch for for that show was Blues Guy. I guess that kind of change in attitude toward that uh, character specifically. Yeah. That's a relatively recent occurrence. And also, it's not funny anymore. It's not the scene's fault. There was a subtlety to it that that doesn't exist anymore. Through the ages of political correctness, there there's a subtlety. Now, college kids who think he's a blues singer sort of means something different, and it is sort of offensive. It didn't mean that at all. We did it. Um, he thought of it. Mark thought of it from my opic comedy view. Uh, I'm a, a white kid that went to college. What if I thought I was a, a blues singer from the '30s? But it's different now. There's some time takes away some of the subtlety sometimes. Is that part of the reason why you know you, you said earlier that you're working with some of the uh, the younger kids on the sketch writing? Is that part of bringing that misc is kind of being able to to bounce some of these things off of them and trying to figure out you know what does and doesn't fly? Yeah, absolutely, and also they're brilliant uh, writers. Um, but, but we're old white guys, and no matter who's on the show with us, we're going to be old white guys. So every now and then remind us we're being old white guys and we'll do it a little less. But, but also, they're, they're not there as uh, lifeguards. Uh, I mean, they are, but they're also, they were also there as writers. But um, I mean, they made us aware of things. Like, we're smart enough that we sort of get, but, but not really <laughs> that smart. 
um, th that's definitely part of the reason why they were, they were there and why they were great. You can only control how much you are uh, you are a white guy. Old you know, white how, guy. That's old, the word. Old white. I didn't want to. I didn't want to say. No, it's true. How does that play out? Like how how do you how do you handle some of those those issues? Being you know five five white guys in a sketch comedy troupe doing doing a show in an environment where everyone is making a very concerted effort to be more inclusive. I think it's our job to be uh, two things, stupid and then open about it later. Be stupid at first, just write what you write. Write uh, what you would write in the 90s, 25 years later, 30 years later, if I do my math properly. And then when you're told that you can't do it, be smart about it, be open about it, and try to find another way, uh, a slightly different way that is still funny. And if it isn't, kill it. I mean, it's got to be as funny as you want it to be, but it can't be offensive. Be stupid at first, write it, and, um, and when you realize that you were stupid and it's going to be offensive, try to change it. And if you can't change it, um, give up. We have a white flag of truce in the office. We should. We should have a white flag of truce. The Kids in the Hall was always a good example of a show that, that could be not offensive, but that, that could push boundaries, you know, generally doing it from a, from a good place and, and doing it from a pretty progressive minded place place do you still feel the opportunity to to do that with the new show yeah uh, you're talking about the other guys <laughs> it's because um the other guys write the controversial stuff for some reason i i thought i was getting into that but there's been a, a bunch of our scene we've written so many scenes it's not a problem uh, and we're going to write more scenes we're, we're going to start shooting um next spring or summer is the plan and we're going to have another uh, month where we rewrite those stuff and write new things and uh scott and bruce lost a, a ton of stuff after Amazon approved it, but then they did the testing in the channels, and so they killed some scenes. We didn't complain; we got it. Uh, and the, but I was the only one that didn't have one scene cut because, like, uh, I'm having my scene called Charlie, uh, my scene where uh, I see I'm a lonely guy living with two cats, and I realize the two cats are planning to kill me. It's like full of scenes, like harmless, inoffensive. Who wants to be the inoffensive guy of the troop? You said you felt like you were you were moving away from that, though. I thought I was when I was writing the podcast. I was writing things. I guess what happened was that I was writing things that I had no idea was offensive and in a different and wouldn't have been in '93. I mean, it always is. I guess it's offensive is timeless, but it wouldn't have been considered that in '93. And then it was being considered that. So I guess maybe I thought I was cooler than I was, uh, and I, I guess I, I and I, maybe I got that out of my system. One of the sketches I killed on my podcast. Uh, I'm I'm not even bringing to the uh, kids in the hall table read because I realize that will just be a lot of trouble when get picked in, um, won't get picked. Um, a guy who's kicked out of the KKK for being an asshole. I, like I just, uh, <laughs> the way it goes. It's a good premise. You could go a different way. And I sort of did. I just found the funniest thing was, and they want to kick him out uh, and he refuses. What do you mean we're supposed to be assholes? And then they get um, a neighbor in the community who happens to be African-American who agrees that he's an asshole and he's sort of siding with the KKK. It's a funny premise and, and it's not, I mean, it, it, I guess it's only offensive in that it involves the KKK, but it obviously its heart is in the right place. You, you feel like that that is a uh, bridge too far? Uh, well, I'm being, I was stupid. I wrote, I don't think it's a bridge too far, but I think it's going to be perceived a bridge too far. So I'll go back to writing my scenes about my, uh, with my cats. <laughs> I think it's going to be um, perceived and, uh, and I'm lucky enough that the ideas are pouring in. I'm not, in the 90s, I would, I would be a, a goofy, angry young man, but angry man, and I would fight for it because it was funny and anything that was funny went in the show. But um, uh, I don't think that so much anymore. This is, our, this is a dated reference too, but you know, like the Chappelle's show sketch yeah. where he's the blind KKK How would that go over now? guy. It's and doesn't, brilliant, you know. brilliant. Yeah, and, and I wonder though, if it was, it was, if it was coming from a, a, a black comedian, a black writer, whether it would be perceived differently. Like kind of what I'm getting at is I wonder if like, if, if you feel like you're, because you're five white guys, that's why you feel like yeah. you, you kind of, you're, you're more sort of, uh, I, I guess, you know, uh, defensive about maybe, it. Maybe that's the case, but I think no matter what, if we were white guys or whatever we'd be, I think we'd be in trouble. Scott gets the most um, bad press from, um, I shouldn't say this, it's probably offensive. And this is Scott talking, so take it with a grain of salt. But he, but he gets more criticism from the gay press, he says. The, and I don't know if that's true, but that's Scott's perception. And I think even crazy Scott's perceptions, there's always a bit of truth in it. I love you, Scott, if you're hearing this, you're not really crazy. I didn't grow up a, a, 
a gay person, I, you know, I, I don't understand the experience, but it, from as, as a, you know, junior high school student watching kids in the hall, you know, as, as I'm sure, you know, a million kids in the States have told you coming on Comedy Central right after school, the representation that the show offered from that standpoint did feel like a huge breakthrough yeah. at the time. So it's interesting to hear that the gay press that he still got put that he still uh, got pushed back for. Yeah, I mean, um, Buddy Cole is like uh, a lot of people he knows, and there are people like Buddy Cole, but some people think maybe that's not the one gay character he should do. I, and I'm I'm not agreeing with it. it. Sounds like I'm agreeing with everyone else. I agree with Scott Thompson. The last time I interviewed you, it was writing for the New York Press, which no longer exists, and you were in New York doing a one man show at I think it was at UCB. That's where it was. I know it was one, I couldn't remember where. Talk about dark sketches that perhaps didn't feel That's dark. That's as dark and as offensive I get. I'm, I personalize I make things about myself. I'm an egomaniac and I, I can, uh, if it's dark, the darkest things I write are things about myself, like the scene Daddy drank and the, the whole one man show and, and, and stuff. I feel uh, I'm nowhere near as good. I'm not comparing him. I, and it's December 8th, so it's funny I'm bringing him up. But uh, my goal is, to, even though I'm almost 60, my goal is to be the um, John Lennon of comedy. But like when he was singing Help um, and I'm a Loser, he, he made it, disguise, he disguised it as um, a Boy Wants Girl song, but he was saying, he was crying for help and he was saying that he was a loser. And that's what I want to do. Um, I want to get my problems across disguised as pure all out comedy, all out comedy, no pathos. I never went for pathos in the one man show. Uh, some, maybe one sentence near the end, I forget. Um, but uh, that's where I get dark. If it's the, if the thing I'm talking about myself is dark, that's the only thing that interests me in, in offensiveness and darkness. And I no way do I go for that, but um, that's what interests me about myself. I, I want every sketch to be like the song, Help. Help, I need somebody. He's crying for help. And then he makes it about a girl who left him. That song specifically, he, you know, he accomplishes that by turning it into something else. But you were very much... I mean, you were writing about yes. an experience that was well, a then, very traumatic experience. Then that's a John Lennon's first solo album, Plastic Ono Band, uh, Elephant's Memory. Uh, that's, uh, sometimes you just, you just do it. But my job, I think, is always to make it funny. Make it funny, but uh, I mean, pathos is an interesting way of putting it. But, you know, why, why avoid... Not the truth. I would never avoid the truth. I just would at least avoid... Okay, let me put it this way. I would at least try my best to avoid easy pathos. If the pathos comes naturally, uh, like I said earlier about the darkness, or that was dark, oh, that was, um, uh, that made me feel sad at the end. Oh, good, because I didn't go for it. I'll, I'll like, that's, I, that, I like that. Specifically, when you've talked about that sketch, the tap shoes, that was an actual reference from life. Like, I, and I got to tell you that um, uh, Norm Hiscock, the fifth Beatles, sixth canal, back in the, in the old days, I came to the office one day and Dave and Norm were hanging out and we didn't have any ideas. So I started telling them what I thought was horrible, sad stories of my father. And then, they, did I tell you this in the last interview? And then they just started laughing. And then Dave said again, those magic words, that could be a sketch. And I never in a million years would I have thought that. It's one thing to do something as a, as a, a sketch. It's another thing to do it as a one-man show. You're obviously touching on some like very personal events in your own life. Avoiding pathos, perhaps, but do you feel like you're trying to get at something, a deeper truth? You know, is it, is it cathartic? Is it, is it therapeutic it was, in some way? Uh, it, was, it was definitely therapeutic. I, the therapy only lasted a few months, <laughs> then I felt screwed up again. But um, but when I did it for the year or two that I did it, it did feel therapeutic. In my mind, like, let's say I'm in the green room with the guy playing guitar for me, be Craig or Alan or Jesse, three of the guys that play guitar for me. Uh, in New York, it was Alan. I'm not thinking I'm about to do a heavy show and I'm going like this again. I, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm doing an all-out comedy show. And I think that's the way you should do it. And I think that's the best way to get the truth across. Because I, I let the words, uh, I guess, literally speak for themselves. And that's the only truth, <laughs> maybe in the show. And maybe if I hit a, like a good acting beat, uh, maybe there's some truth in that too. I had to think myself that I'm about to do an all out comedy show, that it's like Jerry Seinfeld stand up. A lot of the, the, the writers and musicians I, I talk to, you know, tell me that they're, it requires a certain amount of distance in their life to write about a subject matter a certain number of years before they can kind of process things through art in the same way. Um, you know, obviously you were, you were young when you were doing Kids in the Hall, but there was a, a fair amount of time there. I need a day fully to say, you know, that could be a sketch because I never would have thought that in a million years. In fact, you know, we taped that, that's one of the sketches we taped in front of a live audience. Right before um, I went on, I was waiting, it was like 30 seconds to go. And I remember honestly thinking, 
this is going to bomb. I'm going to make these people sad. We're going to make these people, I, which is stupid because Dave is so funny as the dad and I go shticky. And I think that's the reason why I went shticky um, because right before I went on, I had a panic attack that everyone was going to be sad. So you were aware at the time that, that it was a really heavy thing and there was a chance that it, it could potentially mm -hmm. be... All oh, my heavy. life, those stories have been those stories have been sad stories. Dave and Norm were laughing, and I I wasn't going for laughs. <laughs> I was just telling stories, um, for my truth. Like um, I can't say the word anymore, yeah. but I could tell you what my dad really said. Um, and then Dave made it a joke to the word that um, uh, that I guess I'll never do the scene again. I don't want to. People, I don't want to offend anyone. But my dad would I'd say, um, "How many girls did you?" Uh, did you go out with yesterday? Uh, how many girls did you talk to yesterday? How many girls did you talk to today? today? Zero? Zero? You know, zero times zero equals. My dad's real thing was zero. You're a zero, which is meaner. And then Dave made it a much funnier joke with the word. I don't know if you remember the word. I do remember the word. It yes. was a much more offensive word. I, and I, I'll never do it because um, uh, society doesn't want me to, and I understand. Though if I had to, I could justify that word. I mean, in the situation, in the, the character. The time period, even uh, like 1976, like um, I could. It's not even the time period. It's like, it's like clearly, your dad is not the my hero. <laughs> clearly, my dad's sketch. Archie Bunker in that sketch. Was was he gone by the time that that uh, sketch aired? No, it was really funny though. He saw it with his wife Susan Buttons, which is a funny name, and um, we were. At, I went to Montreal. A relative was getting married or something. It was like shortly after that uh, show aired with that scene, and then. A bunch of people were talking and one of my cousins uh, was a little drunk and he said um, uh, to my dad, his name is Hamilton, as I say in the show many times, Hammy. Well, you know that. If you remember. Again, it was a hundred years ago. Why would you remember that? Hammy, did you see the sketch about uh, Kevin's daddy who drank? Uh, and, um, and my dad said, nope, didn't see it. And then Susan, his wife said, yes, we did. We saw it two weeks ago. Remember, we talked about it. Nope, didn't see it. Kevin, he saw it. <laughs> and I think he honestly, that time, didn't think that he that he had seen it. He was around when the show yeah, was yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Was, was he proud or excited for the fact that you? He would leave messages uh, over the, uh, you're just funnier when you don't wear a dress. Or um, the scene where Dave and I, it was called flogging, where Dave and I go to a gym to get whipped and you see blood running down. I remember one, one message, was, it was beautiful in its simplicity. All it was was him saying, no need to bleed. So he was giving constructive criticism. <laughs> he was. He kept saying, just, you know, Jackie Gleason is really funny. Be, I know you can be more like him, Kevin. Be more like Jackie. By the way, I love Jackie yeah. Gleason in The Honeymooners. I love him in all the dramatic movies he did. I, 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 like, I, have, I have no idea. I haven't even read a biography. And I have a feeling he wasn't very nice. The character in The Honeymooners was, uh, I don't know if he actually beat his wife, but he sure made a lot of jokes about it. Yeah, to the moon, Alice. That's Lauren Michaels' uh, theory of comedy. He thinks comedy, because it, it was the most depressing set of all time as Lauren Michaels would say, um, it was sort of the slums. And um, to build, a, he said, it's, it's really, the laughter is more important when you build comedy on Great Depression like that. And you don't go for depression, you go for the comedy, but it's built on something that, um, that makes people naturally sad. And, and there, this was, there I, I started talking about the honeymooners. I guess my dad was right. Yeah, like uh, so sad, like writing a lot of sketches about being stuck inside during COVID, for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of scenes about isolation. That's dealing with a current issue in a, in a kind of- Subconsciously though, subconsciously. I think only a couple of Scott scenes, uh, is it clear that it's during uh, the virus? But um, uh, at least it seems I wrote, the seven or eight that are about isolation. Don't mention it. It's just, uh, I'm a lonely guy in my house or a lonely guy in my apartment. We were sort of heading toward earlier was this idea of needing some uh, distance to, to tackle a personal issue in your life. Do, do you feel like whether the sketches on your podcast or the show coming back now, are, are, are you dealing with subsequent issues in your life in the same way that you did in the Daddy Drink sketch? Yes, uh, but um, in a way... Maybe I'm losing some inspiration, but I'm be becoming a better craftsman at craft. So it's more hidden. Like I just wrote a, I wrote a new scene that I'm going to bring in when we, uh, that month we have in February or March, whatever it's going to be for new scenes. Um, when I was walking my dog yesterday and it's pure shtick, but I know it says a lot about me. <laughs> it says a lot about me. I thought about what the other day, what it meant about me, but I didn't think that when I wrote it, I just thought it was funny shtick. It's about a, a guy who, he has seven dogs and they're barking and growling and he walks down the street. I'm the man with seven dogs and you will cross the street now. And it says a lot about me. Oh, and at the end, because the, the neighbors hate him, 
I just I won't say the funny stuff. I'll just say this. Um, he, he has a funny rant. Hopefully, it's funny about uh, that his life isn't easy being the man with seven dogs. Um, he was a man with eight dogs till the big one killed the bass, ate the bass and hound and stuff like that. And the last thing he says is, "And I have no human friends." And then he goes in, <laughs> and I know that scene is high shtick and more about me than anyone will ever know. So you got the, the sketch about the cats, about the yeah. cats maybe eating I, they, you. You got the dogs. The dog scene unless I take out the cat scene. Because I, I know Bruce is going to say, uh, you can't do cats and dogs. And I, and I have two cats and I have a dog. It's been a while since I've watched Brain Candy, but in, prep, in preparation for this conversation, I, I watched the, the trailer again. And I, I'd forgotten. And no, actually, I watched the, uh, the kind of the behind the scenes, like the promotional video that they right. did. I remember watching that on TV at the time. Somewhere, somebody, somewhere at some point it pointed out the fact that there's a theme in Brain Candy about the animals kind of <laughs> rebelling. Obviously, there's a famous scene with you and the, the cat on your head. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, but I think there's a constant theme throughout the movie of the animals kind of fighting back. There's a dog auditioning, and I, I'm not happy with the dog. Uh, there was going to be more too. Um, Norm actually wrote the first draft, and, and and then we took it over and tore it apart. But there was one thing. It's it's funny because that we kept the punchline there, but we took out the setup. Uh, the best thing in Norm's first draft was, um, and he's brilliant, and it was brilliant, was that there was many scenes like in the boardroom. Uh, a, a blackbird would come to the window uh, up from outside, crash and slide down dead. And we did that two or three times. So when the, the bird hit um, Bruce's eye, that was supposed to be sort of a punchline to that. For some reason, we cut all that. I guess it was hard to do, but we kept the punchline, which is weird. Bruce is walking down, I think, a red carpet, right? And the bird just yeah. slams right into his eye. Yeah, that would have made more sense. I th there's so many things about Brink, and uh, Bruce always makes fun of me. Are you still plan Are you still thinking about how to do the glee comas better? Because we had a fight about the glee coma. And when he said that, he said that on a Zoom meeting a few weeks ago, I said, no, but, and then I went to a rant, it made no sense. I mean, it's supposed to take a few um, weeks to happen. And then Don takes it at the end, Mark's character, and he goes into a coma right away. He makes it, and they were laughing at me because I was serious. Also, there's a, Bruce, uh, Bruce and I wrote a joke that I really liked that we ruined in the movie. And it took me 25 years, a few weeks ago, it hit me how we should have done it. And I think you're going to agree with me. Uh, <laughs> This, uh, the, where they play their white trash couple, Mark and Bruce. Mark's the woman and, the, and Bruce. And the scene in the movie starts where they've already had a, they're in the middle of the fight. Which it's I the think beginning of the movie, right? It's the first scene in the movie. Isn't it yes. the first scene in the movie? Yeah. Uh, it's not the, yeah, it's one of the first ones, isn't it? It's early. I've seen it so many times that I forget. Um, and uh, you, you, you slept with my friend. And then Bruce says, yeah, but don't kill the messenger. It doesn't get a laugh. And it finally hit me. The scene should have started at the beginning. They should have been having a happy time, a dinner or something. And then he sort of said, I got something to tell you. I have to tell you something. What is it? I've been sleeping with your friend Edith. And go, oh, you bastard, you bastard. Hey, hey, don't, don't shoot the messenger. Isn't that at least funnier? Yeah, because I, I know you're teaching uh, sketch writing or you're teaching comedy writing now. Yeah, so I'm forced to think a lot. I, I mean, I, I somehow start thinking, uh, overthinking, yes. Has that always been the case? Yes. And Bruce kids me, but he kids me because he sees that a bit in himself. Bruce is also like that. And the kids in the hall are like that. Uh, when we tour on the tour bus after every show, we, we were always rewriting the scene. I remember we, f we thought of a great way to end the scene at, on the bus after we had done the last show of the tour. I mean, we still like, <laughs> sometimes, we're all obsessed. I think stand-up comedy, sketch, even sketch comedians, it all comes from obsession in some way, I think. Obviously, before the TV show, happened you were a stage troupe you were kind of writing on stage right was it wasn't a fair bit of it improv yeah yeah we um we didn't write anything down i don't know if it was laziness or computers weren't really in our world at that point 84 85 i mean they were in the world but not our world we would um meet uh, rehearsal days and writing days would be the same thing but we never wrote anything down we'd come up with ideas and um and then we'd uh we'd talk about where we could go and then we improvised it over and over until we got sort of the beats and, but we never, except for some of the good jokes and some dialogue that was important, it would change every now and then when we did a live. And that's the first half of uh, season one on our TV show. Um, it was very hard because we were always arguing about, no, I said this, no, I said that. And because we were just writing, um, what do they call it in show business? Scenes out of the trunk.
which means your old states. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how much of, of your kind of, not compulsion, but how much of your- Obsession. Yeah, sure, obsession, that you turn these things over over and over in your head is based on the fact that you, your development as a writer was kind of, was, was woodshedding things and was working the scene over and over again. I think that, and the fact that I'm, I'm sort of like that, I was like that at 12 probably. I would think of something over and over. Um, and sometimes it would just, it was a realistic thing that uh, that was depressing me, something about my father or something in school. And sometimes it, it was a funny thing. And you take that tool, <laughs> it's not a tool, it could be a detriment, but you uh, become a writer, a comedy writer, whatever kind of writer you want to become, that detriment becomes a tool and, and you spin around. I think the best scenes that people write is when they hear something someone else says or, or, or they say themselves in a conversation, they obsess over it. Then they take that line and they exaggerate it. And I, I, exaggerated realism, I think, is um, the best sketch comedy. And I think the best way to, to, to write that is to be obsessed. Do you feel that you've been able to effectively spritz over Zoom, over blue jeans, uh, that you've been able to you know, collaborate in an effective way in spite of being socially distant? You no, know, for me, it was hard. Um, and I guess it'll be hard again. The writer's room, it was perfect for me. If we were there all day like a sitcom, it would have killed me. I wouldn't have been able to write by myself at night. It would have killed me. But we were there for an hour. People would have ideas. What do they call Blue sky. Then you would blue sky. Blue sky, blue sky on blue jeans. And that, and that really helped me. That's how that scene, Lukewarm, came out in, in, the, in the second half of the scene, Cats, because um, I only had the first half in my head. Uh, but on Zoom, it's you can't sort of... The kids in the hall sort of work from interrupting each other. And you can't do that in Zoom because then there's an ugly silence. You go, sorry, you were saying, no, no, go ahead. You were saying, uh, and I could, I was just quiet. So that's sort of the, the technical aspects of Zoom sort of um, killed me from, from sort of collaborating that way. The technical aspects of Zoom and then just being a Canadian. Yeah. And we're also polite. We're mean and polite, <laughs> which is the worst thing. So I'm, I'm trying with Dave this, uh, this Friday. We're going to meet, uh, meet on FaceTime with two people. I hope it'll work because I have an idea. I have an idea. Because he had a few of his scenes cut. He had brilliant scenes. I guess I, don't, I won't say since they're offensive. <laughs> and I thought I, I, the most inoffensive scene ever. And I, I don't think it's Kids in the Hollish. And I don't think it's anywhere near as good as uh, Dave's best scene that was cut. What I wanted to happen is that um, after we're finished with it, We'll think uh, we'll we'll accidentally spritz and think of the real idea. You're still writing in the in the meantime, um, even though everything's kind of been pushed back. I'm writing so I'm writing uh, every now and then I think of a sketch, but I'm also writing uh, a movie, a new one man show, and um, uh, <laughs> sort of a play, sort of like it's a play. It's a play because I was supposed to be Malvolio in uh, Twelfth Night and uh, at some uh, Shakespeare festival where they get either a has been or a minor celebrity every year um, uh, to do and, uh, and uh, I and I still for I think now I'll be able to do it if the Amazon schedule uh, sticks through um, but maybe not anyway I still go through it and I thought it'd be really funny to play myself and you see a bit of um, a few minutes of Shakespeare and then you see the producer going through minor celebrities and picking me and then uh, every now and then you see a scene um, where I ruin it, then you cut uh, back to the rehearsal process where they, they you can't ad-lib Shakespeare. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of getting, I'm gathering all the thoughts of that in my head and I'm writing that. <laughs> it's kind of my version of mainstream, but because it's about Shakespeare, people will think that it's weird. This is the, the one man show, the play that you're describing or? This is the play, this is the play. My one man show is about a relationship between Dave and myself. Um, and it's called uh, Kurt Cobain is trying to tell me something. It's about a little bit about Dave and I, the kids in the hall and rock and roll. Because we were there in Seattle when he killed himself. Uh, we were touring. Bruce has that song, the song Vigil, which is Yeah, about... yeah. He didn't come to the Vigil. I, he says that in the song, right? He's, I forget. I, I haven't heard it for 20 years. He thought we were hacks for going to the Vigil because we got there. He actually died the night before we were in Vancouver. Then we got to the um, uh, Seattle was our next thing. Uh, well, I'll say this is my one-man show, but in the elevator, it, actually, we were in Winnipeg, where I live now. Um, we were in the elevator. We had just met Wayne Gretzky because he was staying there. He thought we were a rock band. And, um, and uh, Scott had met Kurt Cobain. He was, um, he was supposed to call him and get him tickets. And uh, right before Scott got out of the elevator, I said, remember, call Kurt Cobain, get him tickets. And then I got in the room. I put on um, Much Music, which is our MTV. 
and um, they were announcing his death. Just like Scott, he was probably on the phone <laughs> when he was watching uh, the news. Everyone in the troop except for Bruce went to the vigil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we were big Nirvana fans. Damon Scott and I had seen him play. Uh, Bruce loved them too. I think Mark liked them. Mark th- is more into like good voices, so I think he had a good voice. Um, <laughs> but Mark's more like Dean Martin. But we were there, we were fans. It seemed, it would seem crazy not to go. But, but I, I started to get Bruce's thing. I can never articulate it. But um, I guess we, me, me, you, to go is capitalizing on something. I, I, I don't know. People there were just full of real grief. They weren't like, they weren't there to say they were there 25 years later, though I'm sure they do. I do. I just did. So, yeah, yeah, but I wasn't thinking that. I heard you telling a story about not doing a Gap ad. And it sounds like in the heady 90s, when everybody was worried about selling out, that that was a concern of, I guess, two of the five members of, of the troupe. Yeah, I mean, we were, like I said, we were from uh, Queen Street, <laughs> the Greenwich Village of the 50s, Queen Street in the 80s in Toronto. Um, and we thought, we thought stuff like that. People thought stuff like that. Neil Young wrote that song, This Bud's For You the, the parody. Like, and if you were, and you had to think you're an artist, but I'm torn because I know I'm a vaudevillian. Um, uh, so I'm always torn. But the Gap ads, they were at least going for cool and unpretentious, which is pretentious in itself. I understand that to go for unpretentious, but, um, uh, but it wasn't a bad image. It wouldn't have hurt us. I don't, I don't think people would have uh, said we were square for doing it. I get the feeling like probably at some point down the road, people like regret having not done things for Buddy because like, hey, it would be nice to have whatever money yeah. we would have made having done that. They weren't going for superstars, right? They were going for people on the fringe like us. I understand Bruce and Mark, like, like, like I understand it. Uh, like, I don't know who's right on that one. <laughs> I, I don't. Bruce and Mark, they don't regret it, but they, uh, I have heard them say, uh, maybe I would have now. I heard them both say that at different times when they weren't with each other. Was the decision to not have more characters from the show in Brain Candy, was that on a similar wavelength of just not wanting to be too commercial? Warren Michaels thought it was. He kept making fun of us for being artists from, um, that's why I think of that, because he said, uh, I know you're, yeah, I knew you're from Queen Street, you know, you won't do the character. But we don't think like that. I mean, the thing is, and this kills what I'm about to say, because uh, no one, no artist calls themselves an artist, but maybe we are. Because we naturally, we would, if we thought of ideas for Chicken Lady that fit the world, we would have put her in. But we, we just write that. And I'm like, I personally, uh, and it's not pretentious at all. Maybe it's a lack of talent in a way. I have trouble writing recurring characters. I, I just, um, like Simon and Hecubus, the first one, I thought of the idea and I wrote it with Mark. And then after that, Dave and Norm basically wrote them with me standing in front of them laughing and writing it down, what they were saying. I, my brain just doesn't work that way. But no way do I say, no more Simon and Hecubus. I don't think that. I just, it, it stops. Like there's only two King of Empty Promises. The, the, the one where I go, we'll do slip my mind. And uh, the second one isn't very good. I mean, it, it, we may have a new one in the show. Right now it's in the show. I, I'm trying to get, like, get it out. Um, uh, but I, but I, I don't think it, like Bruce does think of that. And Bruce is the coolest guy. And he, like, he thinks of that. He thinks, so well, we got to do more running characters. I mean, he doesn't know. He doesn't think that. But he, he gets excited. Um, he, he likes to keep exploring. Mark's like that, too. Isn't it funny? They were the hippest with the Gap ads, but they like exploring characters. Each way is valid, I think. Um, for me, it's a... Um, I think it is a lack of talent. I just can't think of anything. Else. It's To me, like, it's done. Move on to the next thing. But I don't mean that in a cool or hip way. I mean that in a lack of talent way. <laughs> what else am I going to do with that? We'll do. How many more times do I have to say we'll do or slip my mind for people uh, to have it? They do or they don't. At least like if you had, if I had to pick the two most iconic, well, three most iconic characters, probably two of them are Marks and one of them is a Bruce. I, you know, I, I ca- Cabbage Head, Chicken yeah. Lady and Head Crusher. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a few Cabbage Heads. There's a million chicken ladies and head crushers, but even Mark at the uh, the end, uh, no more head crushers. <laughs> but but it, but we got a lot out before he got to that point. We um uh, and there aren't any head crushers or chicken ladies in this show. It's just um and again, no way do we say no old characters. There are old characters, but ones that people don't care about, like Mark and Bruce is the cops and, like, uh, and things like that. They were in the movie, and they're in the movie. Well, because in sketch comedy. This is the problem I have with the kids. I write many sketches because it's comedy. Everything's back to Keystone Cops. 
you need cops sometimes <laughs> like to get you in trouble. And I always think, oh, should I make it Mark and Bruce or should I make it to the straight man cop? And that's the problem we had. Uh, Norman and I wrote a scene. We watched a French movie and it gave me an idea uh, where Dave and I are ro um, robbing um, um, a money mart. Uh, we come out of a money mart, we, we're robbing and um, uh, we get the money. And as we get to the car, uh, we hear cop sirens. And I say to Dave, um, uh, take everything off. They're looking for two guys with clothes. And we, uh, there's the scene. we went back and forth. Um, in one draft, it was straight cops. In the other draft, it was Mark and Bruce. And then, uh, and they went back. I forget what it is now, actually. And right now, it's in the show, I think. People have an attachment to the characters. And I assume that when the show comes back, obviously, you know, when you were on tour and when the show's coming back, that they are hoping to see some of those characters return. I mean, were you making a concerted effort to attempt to write sketches around existing characters? No, I mean, so, uh, like, there are some, there are some, uh, I, it's, it's for us, it was always, I, and I don't think this is Queen Street. Uh, for us, it's always the idea first. There will be an, uh, an eradicator. Right now, there is a King of Empty Promises. Um, there is a, bu a Buddy Cole. I think we talked about a Mr. Heavyfoot, but uh, I don't think Dave wrote it up. See, and Mark, the, ca the character Mark's bringing back is the French character that people may not remember, Drill. We're, uh, quite excellent. We call him the excellent guy. Quite excellent dinner we're having here, uh, Pierre. Thank you very much. Yeah, he's a French character, exactly. Though he's in lots of sketches. <laughs> there's lots of the, where he's the star. Yeah, there's a Drill sketch. There's, there's the cop sketches. <laughs> there's stuff like, or cops are in other sketches. But they're easier to write for. Well, Mark just loves uh, Drill. He's a great character. It's funny that you can't write the King of Empty Promises because he's you. Yeah, he's totally me. You know, he's me. Uh, you, you probably did research, so you probably read me saying this a million times. But it, it's me. I say, I, it's because I'm the child of an alcoholic. I say, we'll do and slip my mind. And then, um, uh, but it's channeled through the way Paul Bellini talks. Um, because that's all, uh, that's all Paul Bellini. You know Paul Bellini, the guy with the child? I was going to ask you how Paul Bellini is. That was going to be my big, like, final question of the conversation is how Paul Bellini is doing. Oh, because you heard about his, uh, his stroke or whatever it was? Yeah, I mean, and also just, just generally, you know, I, he was, he's, uh, he's a fascinating character. He's doing well. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's in great shape. He teaches uh, writing at Second City. Um, as, uh, every time I see him, he seems happy. I think he's doing very well. Um, and he seems to just leave uh, back to shape. And I forget if we, um, Mark's obsessed with Bellini. Mark's the one who thought of putting Bellini in a towel and poking him with a stick. And I, I, I think we, I, I forget if it's in the show or not, but once in one of our live shows a few years ago, the 2015 tour, he flew to, um, either was, I guess it was New York. It was New York. And in the lobby, he was there with his towel and there was a paintbrush and a can of paint and it was paint Bellini and, uh, and uh, people would uh, come in and paint a stroke until he was all painted. And um, I think Mark was trying to think of some way to do that in the TV show. I, I don't know if we figured that out though. Mark's obsessed with Bellini. Like, that was all Mark's idea. <laughs> he made it into the movie, didn't he? Yeah, uh, he's there for a second in Happiness Pie. Will he be involved in the show at all? We're trying. I forget if he's in right now because we were definitely trying. He was there one day in the writers. He definitely should be. What do you think? Um, we finally decided on something, but um, uh, I'm interested in your opinion. I, f I feel you're at least a fan-ish um, and you're smart about comedy. So um, do you think we should uh, do the exact same theme music like as played, do a different song, take the old song and re-record it? What do you think? I forget our decision actually. Mr. Show just kind of went a, a totally different direction, right? Yeah, which didn't bug me at all. Though I'm anal, and usually you think it would, but seeing that it, it, it didn't, uh, people said, oh, it wasn't like the old show. Well, they're older now. They did, they're doing it sort of a different show. But we also said to ourselves, I don't know if this was right to say it, but um, it made it easier to start the first day of the day one in the writer's room. Uh, let's just think this is the, because we had five seasons in the 90s. Let's just think this is the sixth season of the Kids of Show. We are going with the song. I forget if we're re-recording it or, or, or doing it as is. I forget. I, I, I don't think the Mr. Show song was iconic in the same way that yours i mean yeah. it's an it is it is an iconic theme song yeah i think we're doing it i mean i if monty python came back 25 years later would i have been disappointed if they did a different song they probably if they didn't do a different song they probably would have had a great idea and i would love that we didn't have a great idea for like um <laughs> There's also a good story behind it. How how shadowy men got involved in the show. Sort of. I, we're thinking of the same story. The they went to high school. Uh, Reed, the bass player, and Brian, the guitarist, 
went to high school with um, Bruce. And um, I remember Bruce told me once that a drunk back in Calgary, where they're from, uh, at a party, he, he said to, um, before he knew that he was going to be a kid in the hall, he, he was a teenager, he said to Brian, if I ever get a TV show, you're going to do the music. It was hipper to say that in the in the nineties. Now it's like an old and now I'm an old man saying that old story. No, it's a great story. It's a great story as somebody who has attempted to do so many creative projects in his life and had them fall through and had so many like drunk and or high conversations with like, yeah, when we the yeah, friend. we're going to do this and it's going to be the greatest thing. And those stories, like, it just never happens. And this is a rare instance where, like, it's freaky. It's it actually really happened. Freaky. Yeah. So I know I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I, I think you made the right decision. I'm glad the song's coming back. Glad the show's coming back. Our fans who are, who are less, um, um, you interview comedians and musicians, so your head's more thinky about it. Our fans who just want to enjoy it, I think, will uh, would be disappointed if we didn't if they didn't hear the dum da dum. Do you feel like because it's been so long since you know the show went off the air? Do, do you feel like you're overthinking things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were at, least, at the very least at first. We were. I mean, we had we had two hour meetings about the song. Um, we had an hour and a half meeting about do we do Super Eight. Uh, like, yeah, because it happened and it's so it's like a like a block of stone you have to like go around or go through it's like it's there and it lives we probably we, I, I missed the show probably didn't even think of it they just sat down and wrote and the show became when the show became when they wrote it in 2014 or whatever it was and that's probably a smarter way of doing it uh, maybe we're too interested in our own history I, I don't know but we we took everything like a block of stone super eight um, the shadowy men's song, like what are the segues? Uh, do we do code openings? Uh, we used to, but we don't. Like, uh, everything is a reaction to what we used to do, whether it's whether we decided to exactly do it the same or do it, do it different. So I don't know how that's going to work out. <laughs> It's a reaction to what you used to do, but also like when something like Brain Candy, you know, obviously you you had been wanting to do a movie for a long time. Yeah. Uh, it had been something you've been thinking about. You know, you finally get together. There was some friction in the creative process that, that I'm aware of. And right. obviously the movie wasn't quite the success that you had hoped for a, as a springboard to additional movies. Yes. Part of the sort of the process of, I guess, kind of licking your wounds must be, must be overthinking it and must be thinking like, what, what about it? What about yeah. it wasn't successful? The good news is that, that well, we enjoy the movie. We, we all like the movie. The good news is that the overthinking happened after the movie. Um, and we, th there was no blocks of stone. We just wanted to make a movie. Um, uh, we weren't going to have Chicken Lady in a world that she didn't fit in. If she um, and we, we ended up writing a movie where she didn't fit in, we were going to tell a story. Uh, our biggest theme was that it was going to be a movie. Um, it wasn't going to be a Kids in the Hall show. Yeah, it, um, the Shadowy Men the theme song had no place in it. Craig Northey, our friend from the Odds, a Canadian rock band, uh, they did uh, music that that fits that world perfectly. Uh, of course, he would because he's brilliant. And um, it was good not having any blocks of stone. I do overthink it. This is what I think. It's fitting on December 8th when, we, when I think artistically. I'm getting off soon. I swear to God. I, 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 I know you say it's gone over the time. I'm having fun, though. I compare there's no, everything. There's no time. There's no time limit. I, I want to make that clear. Thank you very much. I compare everything to the, the, how the Beatles did things. And, um, and also That's money. a high people. bar, Kevin. <laughs> I know, I know it's a high bar. But just not, not even the quality. The Beatles started with She Loves You, I Want to Hold Your Hand. They got a little better with Rubber Soul. And then they, got, they peaked with Sgt. Pepper and the White Album. We jumped straight to trying to do Sgt. Pepper. Monty Python, their first movie was their sketch, their, uh, their best sketches filmed over again. Then it was a, a, a gag fest, Holy Grail. Uh, which is my favorite movie of theirs, Laugh-Wise, but their best movie was Life of Brian. They earned it. And same with the Beatles, they earned Sgt. Pepper. Uh, we, we just, it, we, it's not that we were trying to, but we jumped into a, like a comedy about depression. Should that have really been our first movie or our third movie? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It should have been a fun gag fest. Maybe we're Head Crusher in a world where Head Crusher and Chicken Lady did fit in, maybe even a, like a, a bit parts. But uh, that's the kind of overthinking that Bruce makes fun of me, though he would join me uh, if he stayed around for 10 minutes, uh, that kind of overthinking. So is, is Death Comes to Town, is that your meaning of life or where does that fit in? Um, 
I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Death comes to town. Um, that's a good question. How did that end up as a as sort of a more of a narrative piece than than just doing kind of straightforward kids reading? I think because um, we were on tour, and we wanted to. Um, uh, Oh, and it was a tour, our first tour ever that was all new sketches, some which will make the TV show. I don't think all of them are. The, um, and so we were kind of high on the writing new stuff kind of thing. So, um, and we were getting along so well. We were in our late 40s, so we were starting to be polite to each other and not being mean. It just seemed like a, well, this is the way it should have been when we were young. Um, and, and so we were enjoying it. So we started thinking about maybe, um, and Bruce spearheaded the idea from the very beginning, um, of doing something together. It was a movie at first. It was a movie. I think it was Bruce's idea. It, does, it seems like a movie. I mean, it plays like a movie. Yeah, it was a movie. And then we would meet in hotel rooms in the, in the afternoon before shows. And there were so many ideas. It just grew into sort of a mini series. But, but the whole, to me, the exciting thing about it, it was, it was all us trying to um, stay together <laughs> and, uh, and do something. But yeah, it was going to be our second movie to prank Andy. Did you always just kind of know or assume that there would be a, a, a show in the same way, that there would be another sketch show that you would return to that at some point? Well, we all hoped, but it seemed impossible. It seemed uh, crazy. Um, it, it seemed impossible. <laughs> like, like we all hoped, but in the back of my mind, I didn't think it was going to happen. Um, now, Dave and Bruce and their agents had a lot to do with getting the show, so I'm about to give myself credit for it, which is crazy. But um, but here I go. I was doing a weekend in Fort Myers, Florida. I go there every now and then, teach and perform. Uh, I forgot the name of the theater because I'm a bad person. Uh, hi, Fort Myers. And um, this was around 1915, it's 19, 2015, 2000. World War I just started. Comedy was needed. The Archduke Ferdinand met <laughs> yeah, an untimely called demise. Me. He had an idea to get us back on the air. They, so, so someone from the Fort Myers paper, I forget what it's called. Sorry, I'm a bad person. And um, uh, I think it was a he. And he said, uh, he asked me, the, he was asking me the same questions I always hear. The, no offense to him. Uh, who wants to think of different questions for a minor celebrity? And I was getting bored. Just like um, a flashback, side story. This is very short. Um, I kept, uh, back during the TV show days, I started getting bored by telling the true story of how we got the name of the kids in the hall. So once I lied and I got some press and I told them, because uh, one of my favorite albums is uh, London Calling by The Clash. And uh, the song Lost in the Supermarket, he says, and the kids in the halls make noise in the wall, bang something so scarily. And uh, I said, well, we got it from a Clash song. <laughs> and so sometimes I get bored and I lie. So uh, I, I told them that um, we were talking with Lauren, My uh, Lauren Michaels of getting um, in Fort Myers, uh, the Fort Myers guy. Um, it was a complete lie. And, uh, and we were, I said, we were talking of getting a new show with, with Lauren Michaels and we we're just beginning to arrange it now. And then uh, I, I, I guess I don't understand social media. I thought Fort Myers is so fl uh, far away. No one's going to read it. But everybody, New York was calling me and <laughs> Los Angeles, like uh, reporters. And then uh, um, the, uh, a woman who works for Lauren Michael said, is that true? Because um, he doesn't talk about it. I can talk to him again and remind him. And that's how it sort of got started. Though Dave would say that it was him and his agent and Bruce, and they did the work. I just lied. <laughs> <laughs> 